Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. It's great to be here in Kiev. We are really enjoying our time here. Uh, so actually, I'm not going to limit to uh, life science, but uh, I'm going to tell you about different applications of data science and the different PhD uh, programs that we have. So I have um, summarized here what I will talk about in the next uh, half an hour or so. So I will give you a first um, uh, introduction of myself, and then I will try to define uh, what is data science. I will introduce you to the hybrid uh, data science school that I'm coordinating, then to uh, the data science research at the Max Delbruck Center, and then I will give you some practical information about how you can apply to our PhD programs. So who I am, first of all. Uh, I have a master's in chemical engineering uh, from Greece. Then I moved to uh, Denmark and I did a PhD in computational chemistry at the Technical University of Denmark. I stayed there for many years, so I followed all the uh, tenure track uh, path up to associate professor. So I was uh, a group leader in uh, cheminformatics, which is the application of bioinformatics in uh, drug design. And since 2018, I moved to Berlin in Germany and I'm a coordinator of the hybrid uh, data science school. So I decided to start with a definition of data science because since it's a new buzzword, it's not really clearly defined. And if you Google it, you're going to find different descriptions of what is data science, if it is computer science or artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning or how it different it is from all this. And uh, there are also a lot of yeah, discussions about it at the moment. So I found this nice uh, Venn diagram that um, says that um, actually data science is the common ground between uh, computer science, math and statistics, and uh, domain expertise. And you can say basically that it's the application of machine learning on a specific domain. And uh, machine learning also is um, discussed a lot nowadays, is regarded as one of the trendiest things you can study. And that's because uh, recent uh, reports, like the one I have uh, copied here from uh, McKinsey and Company Consultancy, uh, they regard machine learning as a general purpose technology that is similar to electricity and internet, and is going to have impacts, impacts in our society similar to electricity and internet. And the features of such uh, general purpose uh, technologies are that um, they are uh, pervasive and they spread to most sectors, so they are not limited to a specific uh, domain. Uh, they get better over time, so their cost of usage decreases, and uh, they spawn innovation, so they make it easier to invent new products, new processes, new services. And why is it important to have also this part here, the domain expertise? I found this figure that hi highlights it uh, very nicely, I think. So if you are a computer scientist uh, and you don't have an idea of uh, what is the final application of what you are working on, you may end up with solutions that are not really making sense for the domain experts. As in this case, when you're asked to uh, optimally uh, store uh, tennis balls, you may think that, okay, if I cut them in half, I save space. But actually, that doesn't make any sense when you know what are these uh, are used for. So having this, uh, all this in mind, uh, in 2018, uh, the Helmholtz Association, together with all the Berlin universities, decided to establish hybrids, which stands for Helmholtz-Einstein International Berlin Research School in Data Science. And it is a PhD program that focuses on the application of data science in a broad range of scientific domains. Uh, Earth and environment, astronomy, space and planetary research, geosciences, materials and energy, and molecular medicine. And in order to make this possible, as you can imagine, we need a lot of different partners that will come with a different domain expertise. So there are six Helmholtz partners in hybrids, and you see them here. This is the Greater Berlin Area map, and uh, these are the different 
Helmholtz centers around Berlin, and uh, the data science expertise comes from the university side, the um, data science departments that are under an umbrella association called the uh, Einstein Center Digital Future. So there we have uh, um, Humboldt University, the Technical University of Berlin, the Free University and Charité University. We had our first recruitment in spring 2018 and we filled the first 13 PhD positions. Uh, here I wanted to show you how that uh, it's not only German students, less than half are from Germany and the rest come from India, Russia, the Netherlands and Chile. The, also their Master of Science background is very different. About half of them come with uh, computer science expertise but uh, the rest come with a domain expertise, which means that during the first year of their PhD, they should be trained on the missing expertise. So if they are computer scientists, they should take courses on the domain side and vice versa. And uh, this spring we had uh, three more uh, students in hybrids and actually, uh, we just had a new recruitment round. The application uh, deadline was uh, February 7th. And in a month from now, we, uh, we are having the interviews. And the next recruitment round uh, will probably be announced in the autumn. So keep us in your radar if you're interested to apply. Uh, here I wanted to show you how versatile the PhD projects of hybrids are. Mm -hmm. So I created this um, word cloud with the project titles. And as you see, data analytics and machine learning dominate, but you can also find words that hint to the different uh, domains. So we have planets, we have earthquakes, permafrost, transportation, radar, RNA sequencing, and weather. So it's really very, very broad. I will um, just present in a little bit more detail three of these projects, just to give you an idea of what they are about. So one is a collaboration between uh, the Technical University and KFZ, uh, where Henning Lilienkamp is the PhD student, and he studies the impact of uh, earthquakes on uh, infrastructures. So as you probably know, um, earthquakes for some areas of the world uh, are a great danger, not only for human lives, but also because of the destruction of roads and buildings and railways and other human-made uh, 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 structures. So it is very useful to be able first to assess what would be the impact of an earthquake that has just happened, but also to um, assess the risk of an earthquake happening in the future in a specific area. And so far, statistical methods have um, a lot of computational complexity that do not allow for real-time assessment. And simpler methods are too simple to be accurate. So what is Henning trying is to uh, introduce machine learning in, uh, in this um, flow chart in order to make possible the modeling and uh, the, most uh, the more accurate prediction uh, of the risk uh, assessment after an earthquake. Uh, then from earthquakes we move to satellites and that is a project uh, between uh, DLR and Humboldt University where Olga Kondrateva is uh, the PhD student. Uh, so uh, the problem here is that um, with remote sensing, it is becoming more and more uh, needed to have um, accurate geographical location uh, to be able to determine um, in detail. And, and that could find different applications, like for example, to identify uh, fires uh, as soon as uh, uh, possible, or to estimate the effect of a hurricane uh, or an or earthquake as uh, accurately and uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and that means that a lot of data that are gathered on the satellite need to be uh, analyzed on real time. And that's 
computationally very hard for the memory of uh, the satellite. So uh, Olga is trying to use FPGA processing in order to allow for uh, uh, dealing with such huge volumes of data on real, for real-time assessments for on the satellite. And a third project that I have chosen uh, moves us even further from satellites to planets. And that is a collaboration between the Technical University of Berlin and the space, uh, the German Space Institute, DLR. That's a project of Siddharth Agarwal. And he studies the interior evolution of terrestrial planets and also their present state. And what is um, the state of the art here is that usually we receive data from, airspace, uh, from aircrafts uh, in order to uh, predict uh, the evolution and the current state of terrestrial planets. And this misses a lot of important key parameters that have to do with the um, uh, heat inside the, the heat yeah, uh, inside the planet and also um, uh, material properties of the planet. So what um, Siddharth is doing is that he's simulating planets with a lot of um, possible parameters. And using deep learning, he's trying to identify the key parameters that are important to uh, accurately describe their evolution and present state. And then that model could be used for real planets on real data, hopefully. And uh, something that I wanted to stress out is that uh, when you are a PhD student in hybrids, um, we make sure that you get also very good supervision. You have uh, two supervisors, one from the data science and one from the domain. And there are um, frequent meetings with both, both supervisors and there are also annual meetings with the thesis advisory committee that you have to report each year your progress and discuss your future steps. So we make sure that you stay on track and we don't um, uh, have any serious problems on the third or fourth year of your studies. Then we make sure that you get uh, the necessary scientific training in the beginning because it is an interdisciplinary project. So you have to uh, become an expert on both areas and you have to take the necessary courses for that. And uh, besides that, we also make sure that you get uh, soft skill training. We uh, either develop ourselves uh, courses on um, uh, scientific presentation or scientific uh, writing or uh, project management, for example, whatever um, uh, is necessary for um, your future career after the PhD, whatever that uh, you decide to be. And of course, we also encourage people to participate uh, to conferences annually. We organize retreats where all the hybrid students come together and they exchange uh, their experiences on their projects. Um, and there are different lab meetings and seminars that make uh, the life of the PhD not boring at all and really interesting, I would say. Uh, so if you want to learn more about hybrids, we have uh, a homepage where we describe our projects, the people, um, the collaborators, the current events and training. So you're very welcome to have a look for more information. So now I will uh, switch a little bit and talk more about uh, data science in respect to life science research at MDC. So hybrids is coordinated by MDC, but it it's, MTC is one of the partners. It's one of the six domain expertise. Uh, at the same time, data science is a cross-cutting focus area uh, at the MTC, which means that uh, different groups belonging to different research areas that are also active in uh, data science, they have joined forces in order, in order to boost this more. So the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine um, is part of the Helmholtz Association and is a major biomedical research institute in Berlin. Uh, this is uh, Max Delbruck himself. And just to give you an idea of the MDC numbers, currently there are 1,660 employees. There are 69 different research labs. 
uh, and it's a very international place. Uh, there are 380 PhD students and 60% of them are international. These are the different research themes of uh, MDC. Uh, there are groups active in cancer research, in uh, cardiovascular and metabolic diseases, in diseases of the nervous system, in medical systems biology, and in clinical research. I'm not going to get into details about this, but you can find everything in our uh, webpage. Uh, as I said, I would uh, give you an idea of how data science goes into these research areas. So first of all, data science is very important for life science in general, obviously, and we have seen that uh, new um, uh, domains uh, such as bioinformatics and systems biology have started because of the application of data science in life science. So it is a uh, relationship that uh, has a lot of future still. So under the first sub-area, of uh, data science at the MDC. We see uh, groups that are active in omics and precision medicine, for example, uh, on computational regulatory, uh, regulatory genomics or on machine learning and modeling for uh, cancer genomics or single cell uh, systems biology for personalized medicine, just to give a few examples. And here is uh, an example from uh, the lab of uh, Altuna Akalin from this sub-area. Uh, this is um, a recently published uh, Python library, Yangu, uh, which uh, facilitates deep learning for genomics. So basically, um, we know that people use different tools on different data sets for uh, machine learning and deep learning for different um, uh, questions, biological questions, but it's very difficult to, um, to use the same tools on a different set of data sets or for a different uh, biological question. So what uh, the researchers here uh, try to do is to provide the infrastructure uh, where this is made easier by um, uh, being able, for example, to load data in different file formats and integrate them in this environment, be able to use different machine learning tools and select the best one for the, this type of data. Then uh, the second uh, sub-area is uh, data integration and disease modeling. And here um, we have uh, groups active in uh, Mathematical cell physiology, for example, uh, mathematical uh, modeling of cellular processes. So here, basically, um, the, these groups uh, integrate uh, in, in um, quantitative mathematical models, uh, biological data, uh, molecular data, genomic, proteomic data, in order to create models that answer different biological questions. So here is an example from um, uh, the lab of Jana Wolf that has, uh, was published recently in Cell Systems. Basically, what they did here was that they developed a mathematical, uh, a quantitative mathematical model to uh, facilitate uh, the analysis of gene expression data. So they, uh, uh, they have included it in gene expression anal analysis and they have found that um, uh, it, it uh, improves the accuracy of gene expression when you are combining single cell data together with abundance data. I'm not going into more details, but just to give uh, an idea of the general framework. Third sub-area is biomedical image analysis and complex phenotyping. And here we have two active groups at the MTC, one on biomedical image analysis and one on microscopy, image analysis and modeling of developing uh, organisms. So what these groups do is that uh, they create tools for the acquisition, the analysis, the visualization of data from images. 
And these images could be uh, whole in vivo organisms, or could be a model organism, or could be also at the molecular level. So they vary in size. And here is an example from epithelial cells, where they have uh, used uh, uh, machine learning uh, to um, uh, create models for segmentation and tracking of epithelial cells, uh, which is a very common problem uh, for uh, cell biologists. And currently, it uh, takes a lot of heuristics and a lot of manual curation to uh, achieve. So really, being able to use machine learning makes things more accurate and faster. And the fourth uh, sub-area is epidemiology and health data integration where uh, the researchers under this uh, sub-area um, connect, integrate uh, molecular biological data with uh, epidemiological data or phenotypic data. Could be from insurance companies, for example, where we have data, different types of phenotypic data from healthy and uh, diseased individuals. And they do that with the scope of uh, um, uh, uh, learning more about certain diseases and um, uh, being uh, better in uh, designing better therapeutics for these diseases. I have selected here an example from uh, the lab of Sophia Forslund. So she's working a lot with uh, the microbiome, and this is another very trendy area at the moment. So uh, she's integrating uh, microbiome data with uh, host data, and she's, uh, she's uh, designing uh, fasting studies, and her focus is cardiovascular diseases, um, but also um, she has some other examples uh, of projects for uh, healthy subjects. So what basically happens here is that uh, you take um, a number of individuals that have uh, metabolic syndrome, for example, you, um, they undergo a specific fasting interve intervention for a period of time, one week or more. Then you take um, blood sample, stool sample, and uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, qualitative um, data from questionnaires or uh, other health-related data. And uh, you analyze all this in order to uh, identify which are the key players in the microbiome that uh, are important for this disease. You could identify, for example, new disease targets for uh, medicine or new biomarkers. And um, she has also worked with uh, multiple sclerosis, um, the effect of fasting in healthy subjects, so how fasting uh, influences your microbiome and how different that is between my microbiome and your microbiome and so on and so forth. So the most interesting uh, part now of my talk is how you can join uh, and become a PhD student as well. Um, I will talk first about becoming a PhD student at, at the MDC. Hybrids uh, is sim it's a similar process, but it is kind of a parallel track. We don't follow the same uh, dates. Uh, so there are three main ways to uh, come closer to the MDC. One is to um, do a small internship, like uh, with Erasmus, to come and do your master uh, project there. Another way is to start uh, direct contact with a research group leader that uh, you like what he or she is doing. So if you have a specific area that you would really like to, um, to get uh, expertise on, it, uh, it would be a good idea to write directly to this group leader and explain your idea and ask if there are possibilities for a small internship. And uh, sometimes, yeah, this has uh, resulted to... Uh, to even a PhD project afterwards. And the third uh, way is to come through our international PhD program interview week. And what is that? We have two rounds, a uh, spring round in March, 
where the call for applications is in November and January, earlier, and a fall round in September, where the applications are between May and July. So now in May, we will open the call for uh, the September round. Everything, the whole application uh, is done via our online portal, and you can already go there and read um, a lot of um, useful information about how to apply and what is required and so on. And briefly, we need uh, information about your education, your research experience. So research experience meaning your bachelor project, your uh, master's project, any other internship that you may have had, any other um, projects that uh, you think it's relevant to the position you would like to apply for at the MDC, you can mention it there. Uh, and then um, your motivation, why you want to uh, come to the MDC, and which projects, which uh, groups have uh, uh, attracted you the most. And two reference letters, uh, these come typically from your uh, Master of Science supervisor, uh, where you did your master thesis, or um, another um, professor that you have had close contact through a course, through um, field work, whatever, a person that knows you and can say something meaningful about you. So usually um, it's not nice to uh, receive uh, reference letters that are two lines like, yeah, I highly recommend this person, take him or her. Uh, it's nice when you select somebody that really knows you and can say a few more things about you. Then uh, we screen um, uh, your applications and we uh, score them and we invite about uh, 50 candidates, 50 applicants for the interview week in Berlin. And when you come for the interview week in Berlin, uh, you, uh, you are asked to present, your, uh, to present a project usually is your master thesis, uh, then um, you have the opportunity to listen to presentations from all the research groups of the MDC that participate in the, in, uh, the recruitment. So you get an idea of uh, the research area and what kind of topics are available. Uh, then we also organize panel discussions. So in advance, uh, you have selected, before coming to the interview week, you have selected one out of uh, six, five, six papers that we have pre-selected, you have selected one which you bring to a panel of uh, MDC uh, group leaders and you are discussing it there. You go into depth about the methodology, the approach, the discussion, and um, any, any weaknesses that you may identify. So that is basically in order to evaluate your critical thinking and your scientific background and your ability to discuss uh, science. And then, of course, we also organize personal interviews with the group leaders that you are interested in meeting and they're also interested in meeting you. So um, you have, uh, on average, between three and four uh, different one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews. And at the end of this interview week, uh, you select your favorite project, the group leaders select their favorite candidate, and usually there is a match, so you are uh, given funding for a PhD position. Uh, so to give you an idea about the bottleneck, uh, the different bottlenecks, we start with uh, six to 200 uh, applications. The screening, allows only 10% to move on. So we end up with about 50 applicants being invited. But once you are invited, there are high chances that you will live with a project. So one out of two of the applicants that do come to the interview week in Berlin uh, are given um, a project, a PhD project. And um, also to give you an idea of how much we um, uh, evaluate each of the different uh, uh, pieces of your application. Uh, your education um, gets about 40%. Uh, 
uh, the research experience about 15, the motivation letters about 15, different honors, awards, publications you may have, participation in conferences, etc., give you a 10%, and the le uh, reference letters, the final 20%. So this is our ranking system. And uh, I have left us uh, last uh, how it is to live in Berlin in general. Um, I believe there is not so hard to convince you that Berlin is a great city and uh, it's very international. Um, most people that I know love Berlin. I haven't heard anyone complaining. It has things for everyone. Uh, out of the 3.7 million, 750,000 are foreigners. Uh, so you don't even have to be fluent in German. It helps to know German because it helps you in integrating, but English is the working language. And, and if you have to choose between the two, uh, which one to perfect, I would say English 100%. Then there are a lot, a lot of cultural activities, uh, a lot of parks, gardens, a lot of events in general. And um, it's a street, uh, it's a, I think, um, a city that you not to get bored of uh, throughout your PhD studies. So, uh, and even longer. <laughs> so with that, I would like uh, to finish. And thank you for your attention. And yeah, if you have any questions, we can discuss them more. that are included where? So when I presented hybrids, there are six different research institutes there. And they are from astrophysics to uh, geoscience, polar research. MDC is just one of the six. And MDC is on life science. But the rest of the Helmholtz centers, each one is uh, expert in a specific domain. Mm, I think that uh, can be organized on an individual basis. So there are group leaders that have collaborations with other institutes, in, national or international, but we don't have an organized um, scheme for that. It, you have to contact individual group leaders and ask. Agricultural. Mm, not that I'm aware of.
You mean from uh, on the very first slide when I talked about my own uh, ah, in the uh, hybrid, uh, uh, hybrid? Well, MDC is uh, coming with a life science uh, expertise, but uh, there isn't any project on drug design at the moment. Um, that's again something that uh, should be organized on an individual basis. So for example, the DAD scholarships that uh, you can get in order uh, to come to, Berlin, to uh, Germany to do, your, to do an internship. Or I don't know, is it only for master uh, thesis, so, the DAD? Um, No. So we're no. not a, we're a research institute, we're not uh, a university, so we, we don't have master programs. Um, there are three uh, bigger universities in Berlin that are offering master programs, which are still, I think, free for uh, foreign students. So the only thing you're paying at the um, uh, universities in, in Germany are uh, semester fees which are around um, 300 euros per semester um, and some of the, of the universities have international programs like Charité uh, Medical University has international PhD program in molecular medicine and similar. So uh, Magda which center itself since it's not a university we don't have master programs but uh, we have projects for master thesis. Um, 
it's good to have, but it's not necessary because everything, when you come as a PhD student, everything is in English. Um, you can come with some basic German knowledge which you can improve while you're there. MDC offers uh, German classes also that you can attend. But the most important is that you are really fluent in English and you can uh, um, write to some degree scientific texts and present them. Study remotely? Yeah, or part remotely and not from Berlin, but somewhere from Germany. Mm. No, no. Especially, mm -hmm. Biology, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. computational, maybe you can spend some uh, specific amount. We actually have some collaborative um, exchange projects with some programs with some um, other universities, like there is a collaborative exchange school between um, our institute and some Israeli institutions, or there is another uh, exchange program with uh, NYU in New York, but those are specific structured mm -hmm. programs where you have then two um, um, mentors, uh, one from each institution, and in that case you can, you're can you more mobile, so you can spend up to 50% time in a partner institution, but in general, so you have to be on this call. Okay, let us thank all the speakers again.